In a previous talk, I gave a very brief sketch of the curriculum of the Yang style and tried to provide some sort of rationale for its existence, for the existence of a curriculum. Uh, the reason for this was, um, I think when a lot of people study Taiji, their goals are rather vague. Uh, you're, sort of, you're sort of being given this exercise to do, which looks very beautiful and will kind of charm your friends. And then you're told, not only that, it's also very good for you, it's very healthy, you can do it to an advanced age, it's very, all sounds really great. And then you're given this like other exercise, perhaps, uh, this twice-show exercise, which is very simple because it doesn't have any steps to it. You can just put your feet in one place and the whole point is doing it. And you can approach this exercise as, as uh, peacefully or as aggressively as you like. Uh, some people... Uh, you know, say, well, no, it's just a sort of touchy-feely, you know, relax and, you know, change. And, and then it's like, no, this is a very serious thing where we're all trying to, like, shove each other as hard as we can, or at least make somebody take a step that we assume that means he's disadvantageous and he's losing and so forth. And I explained that uh, the problem with Tai Chi Chuan, really, in terms of its appearance, is that it does not try to show you actually what you do when you fight somebody. So, you know, this idea that Toy Show is any sort of model for uh, your eventual kind of martial art, you know, persona is completely absurd. And unfortunately, it's infected people <laughs> to the point where people have come to me and say, oh, I, I have no need to learn anything about stepping or, because I'm just so great at like keeping my feet in the same place that people will just bounce off of me. And it's just this whole stepping thing is just kind of. Uh, tragic kind of silliness. Uh, well, in fact, the worst thing you can call a martial arts school is a dancing school. <laughs> now, a dancing school by itself is not an insult, but when you say that about a martial arts school, what you're saying, in effect, is they practice sort of predetermined uh, steps with each other in which one person does one thing and the other person defends. And so essentially they are dancing in a way that pantomimes uh, fighting. So, you know, this is pretty scorned and it's said, you know, you have to be more realistic and not just have a dancing school. So uh, the history of martial art has been in a way to sort of solve that in some sort of fashion. And it's, you know, there's not been a lot of real successful uh, attempts at it. And I happen to think Tai, tai Chi Chuan is the most successful attempt that's ever been made. Uh, so today I thought I would give you uh, a little bit more uh, concentrated look at the different uh, steps in the curriculum of the Yang style. Uh, and maybe to do that, I will have to sort of explain why Tai Chi Chuan is called Tai Chi Chuan. I'll remind you in the previous lecture, I said that the real goal of Tai Chi Chuan is encompassed in the original name of Tai Chi Chuan, which was long or continuous boxing. In other words, the practice of continuous change with a person who is sophisticated, and then you can be sophisticated, and the two of you can continuously change and discover new things about footwork, timing, boxing, etc., whatever. And uh, this is, of course, the ideal, in a certain sense, of all schools. And all schools, even the ones who are accused of being boxing schools, I mean, uh, dancing schools, will tell you right away, no, no, we're not a dancing school, we're doing that other thing you said, we're doing this very sophisticated thing. Well, it's true, sometimes they are, but usually this is limited to extremely talented people. People with great natural talent. And sometimes in a martial arts school, they can just find a forum where they can find each other and also find other people to practice beating up. And they can become extremely skillful. And uh, within a certain limited range of people, they can exhibit this kind of very beautiful, creative thing. But this does not mean the school has a whole method of producing this. And this is, it's in other words, most teachers will tell you that footwork and timing is really kind of a mysterious thing in the sense that it's so much a matter of natural talent. And, uh, you know, there aren't really any, any real methods of teaching this. Well, Tai Chi really is, and I mentioned that before. The method is 
making Taijis. Now, the first step in the curriculum is the form. And the form is absolutely necessary because it doesn't matter how good you are at making Taijis if the structure that's making those Taijis is disordered, messed up, or, you know, some, some kind of inconvenient position. It doesn't matter how well you make Taijis, your, your body fails you. So the form is, in a sense, it's made for the inculcation of a lot of very counterintuitive and really little, little practiced uh, physical habits which become internalized at the point where you can use them when you're not thinking about them. And anything that you can't use when you're not thinking about it isn't any good to you in boxing. <laughs> the whole secret of fighting is to not think. So all this stuff has to be put into the realm of extremely subconscious behavior. So you're inculcating a bunch of very subconscious rules. Some of those rules are simply rules of what we would call posture in the simplest sense. I guess the most accessible one in that case is the idea of plucking up the back. Plucking up the back is something I've taught for years and it is a little more subtle than it might seem. Uh, I'm not going to try to teach it today, but let's just say this is one of the more important points of posture. Uh, other points of posture are, in a sense, more invisible. They are sometimes uh, physical actions which sort of counteract each other. Sometimes uh, they are movements that seem like you're training something that's a very small movement, but actually the purpose of that very small movement is to counteract some other force so that it's supposed to keep movement within a small range. So it's nothing wrong with it being a small movement. Uh, in other words, you're learning a lot of kind of subtle things about the body that you're not quite sure of why. One of the... <laughs> One of the things that's been said by actually some very great exponents of Tai Chi Chuan is that one of the most difficult things about it is figuring out what it is you're actually learning how to do. Because these initial exercises are very um, abstracted in the sense that they are extremely, they try to eliminate as many variables as possible in what you're doing. So they're the opposite of realistic. In fact, they are as unrealistic as possible in a certain sense because you're trying to learn something that if it was realistic at all, you would never be able to learn it. <laughs> you can't just get in a fight with someone and say, while I'm fighting, I'm going to practice, you know, chants of Jing and, you know, I'm sorry, things are going a little fast for that. So the form is a chance to inculcate a lot of extremely important rules of posture, which you will just follow without thinking. And actually what's amazing to me as a teacher is how easily people can actually learn these rules. I mean, yes, it takes a while. It takes a long time. But some of them are so subtle that when you first hear them, you say, uh, I'm supposed to be able to actually do that unconsciously. And these are not physically difficult things, but they're things that seem so you know, out of the realm of the way people normally do things that it's amazing afterwards that one of the characteristics of Taiji is that it's known for looking extremely natural. Uh, like extremely natural movement, so that uh, you're not you're not showing your ability by fancy uh, contortions and so forth. And it, that's a classic that refers to that. You know, it says it's upright, tranquil, and comfortable. Uh, so this seems to belie the complexity of what you're learning, but actually it works fine. Now the second thing in the curriculum is toy show uh, to do. Any kind of boxing, you need to have yourself in order, and you need to have a way of relating to a, a, the opponent. Now, I hesitate almost to say opponent because in in the training of Tai Chi Tuan, your opponent is your partner. You are both participating in uh, an elaborate set of rules uh, that allow you to do something very sophisticated with your body. <clears throat> and this is the rules of making Taijis. So the first thing you'll say, anyone says when you mention any kind of rule you're following in a martial art, they say, well, what if I don't follow that rule? What are you going to do then? This is not intended to be how you fight people. You don't attack them with your Taijis. <clears throat> the tai chi is a training device which you do with another person. And believe me, it's difficult enough with the other person cooperating 100%. But in this training, 
Uh, and by the way, the technical term for making tighties with the opponent is adherence. You hear a lot about adherence, and it's hardly ever explained to you. It's only told, oh, it's when you like make the opponent backed up. Well, there's a lot of ways of making the opponent backed up uh, that aren't adherence, <laughs> that are just like jamming him, you know. Uh, but this is a very sophisticated thing, which has this effect also when it's done in a very complete way of making the opponent feel like he's sort of trapped. But in a certain sense, it's a mutual feeling. Because everything, when you make Tai Chi's, is mutual. And you are uh, learning, that's the whole purpose of fixed hand pushing. Because if you uh, try to learn how to make Tai Chi's and you're allowed to move your feet, you will do a lot of neutralization just by moving your body away from the opponent. And it's very important that you learn to neutralize in a very, very disciplined manner, which keeps your own center still, and which also relates to the center between you and the opponent. These are very important aspects of Tai Chi that you really cannot train when you're jumping around and running around. So fixed step hand pushing has this as its purpose. Its purpose is not to teach you how to like never move your feet. In fact, its purpose is to teach you how to move your feet, but literally how to move your feet. And the way you move your feet in Tai Chi Chuan is the steps follow the changes of the body. All of these manipulations with Tai Chi's are the changes of the body. And if, if you learn all this stuff about the changes of the body and you do not use it to learn how to take steps, you sort of wasted it. Uh, but this perspective of learning how to take steps also gives you a perspective back on the previous disciplines. And you say, oh, now I see why that was important and why this is important. And without that perspective, you're liable to gradually leave those things out of your training. And finally, it all just becomes, the, the form just becomes a pretty thing that you do like a dance. And then Tui Show becomes like just learning how to shove people, which can come in handy sometime, I suppose. But that is not the intention of that particular training. Now, there's a sort of graduation exercise from... Uh, well, it's not a graduation exercise. It's the next step in the curriculum. And this is three-step hand pushing. But this is where you finally say, okay, I'm finally going to take some steps. So the steps are very stylized. They're very simple. They're, they're not complicated at all. But they, they serve to break through this feeling that you can't step. And in fact, then you realize, actually, I'm supposed to be able to step at the slightest touch. I'm supposed to interpret that in such a way that it might move my feet. Not that I'm supposed to resist moving my feet as long as possible. So three-step toy show specifically teaches you how to deal with aggression in terms of someone trying to take over your space. And you, in three-step toy show, you stick to this form called Peng Lujian, which is a set form, but it includes a very uh, informative set of changes of four of the, what they call postures, four martial techniques. So you keep these four martial techniques, but then you learn how to apply them while stepping forward and stepping backward. And then also stepping in circles as a circular toy show. Uh, but the real lesson is learned with three-step toy show. And then you go to Dalu. Dalu is, um, first of all, it adds a couple of postures that you don't, uh, like four postures exactly, that you don't practice in uh, even in three-step, it adds like uh, the shoulder and the pull and uh, the elbow and the split. Okay. Now, even in Dalu, there's two versions of Dalu. One is sort of like the, the simpler version of Dalu, which practices the pull and the shoulder. And then there's a more difficult version of Dalu that practices the elbow and the split. And in particular, this difficult version of Dalu includes the ability to have a discharge occur in your relation with the partner opponent. And I, I say it's not about how you discharge someone, because really the skill is in the discharge-y. Uh, as uh, one of my teachers uh, said, you know, you can't discharge your grandma. You can't discharge a drunk. You can't discharge a lot of people because they're not trained enough to be discharged. You'll just like knock them down or kill them. But this is not a discharge. A discharge describes a sophisticated event between two players. 
and the presence of a discharge as the final kind of test of Glalu, that's, that's in a way your graduation exercise. After that, you move to Sancho. Now, Sancho is a large number of technical, uh, you know, boxing techniques, you might say, which includes a large variety of steps and a large number of, you know, sort of more sophisticated situations, for instance, where you are not in such continuous contact with the person, but maybe you only have contact with them at one point. It's what I call, you have to start dealing with what I call open taijins. But you still have this agreement with the other player that everything you're doing is based on t making taijis. So you have a very strong agreement, but it's not a dancing school because you are not agreeing that when I do you know, like this one technique, then you answer me with this other technique. No, it's only an agreement that we will both try to keep making taijis. <laughs> and we'll both try to keep these taijis as continuous as possible. And when this happens, you discover, to me, an amazing thing. And that is, it actually causes you to have very interesting boxing uh, movements. And if you've been in any other school of boxing before, you'll see this immediately. Uh, and it's kind of amazing that it produces this kind of sophistication. So finally, uh, as a result of playing with these high-level techniques in a very, very sophisticated way, you finally reach the point where you become freer and freer and freer, and you are not doing then this Sancho exercise, which is just a kind of example of how two people play together. You are sort of guaranteed in the exercise that everything there can keep a continuity of Taijis. And so play, by playing with that, you learn how it feels to have a situation where you have this continuity. And then you can become more and more creative. You can switch sides. You can do that on the left side instead of the right side. You can, uh, and then you find yourself actually inventing things that you realize later are completely sophisticated and they're completely okay. And this is an extremely creative and rewarding feeling. This is the ultimate purpose of the Yang style.